Welcome to Planet Vero Radio, recorded at the Idea Garden Advertising Studios in Vero Beach. This is the story of liberty with your host, John Bona. Good evening and welcome to the story of liberty. I'm your host, John Bona, and our co-hosts, uh, Jennifer Featherstone and Dan Williamson. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, John. Welcome from the blustery three degrees above that our day began with here in Bloomington, Minnesota. Wow. Any snow up there? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. My little guy and I will be out cross-country skiing this evening in the moonlight. Well, I, I can tell you here in balmy Florida, it's about 70, Wayne, right? It's beautiful. And uh, uh, we're having a good time here, Jenna. This is uh, we got to bring you down here, Dan, in February when it gets really really cold. Well, John, I always need that nice thaw during the prayer breakfast just to kind of find cold, change my feet from cold feet to warm feet for about a week. Yeah, that's. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned that. The uh, prayer breakfast this year is February 7th on a Tuesday, and the, and the keynote is Anne Graham Lotz, the daughter of Billy Graham. And uh, I know Billy is like 93 now, something like that. And uh, he just it was hospitalized and doing well, uh, and he's I think he's almost back home now if he's not home already. And so we're excited to have the daughter of Billy Graham as our keynote speaker. It'll be in, in Riverside Park in a large tent. And uh, so we're excited about that. Uh, th- this will be the eighth annual prayer breakfast. You know, and I know Billy Graham, following his career, he was a uh, great proponent of life. Um, as he preached the gospel, he he realized that life was a major, you know, theme of the Bible throughout his career. And he was a great, um, uh, a great man of God who always brought that strength and purpose to his message. And uh, that's, that's what we'll talk about tonight, the precious value of life again. You know, the pursuit of happiness is um, as enshrined in our Declaration of Independence was a uh, a phrase recognizing that America's happiness and really mankind's happiness, you know, depends on a right understanding and impl- implementation in the culture, in society, of the uh, fixed uh, and unchangeable moral laws of God. See, they, they didn't change. You know, no law enacted by man, um, Blackstone, William Blackstone said, uh, the great William Blackstone, who a lot of our founders took a lot of their information from. And I know, Dan, you've done a lot of reading on Blackstone. But he said that no law enacted by man was legitimate unless it reflected the higher law of God, the moral law of God as revealed in the scriptures. And, you know, that that was the primary reason, for example, why laws against murder, you know, adultery, even theft, lying, were wrong. There was right and wrong. There was an absolute truth, absolutely right and absolutely wrong. And, you know, these basic principles are found in the Ten Commandments. Ultimately, that's where William Blackstone and John Locke and all the other great writers got that from, that philosophy. And it was a, the basis for both biblical faith, Christian faith, and American law, our own laws here. Now, all governments have to be, you know, they have to be grounded in God's moral revelation in order to function properly. And, you know, we see nations that, you know, where you you have a tyrant and it's it's man's law, and then the entire nation suffers, like Hitler and Stalin and all these people that took control. And now we got a guy in Venezuela, Hugo Chavez, who wants to make all the laws, and you know he's a tyrant. It's the same thing. The people suffer. But you know, unfortunately, today the primary reason why. A lot of abortion advocates, and this this law is, you know, yes, abortion is legal in America, but this law is so bad, and, you know, that's why 
people that support this, that are advocates of abortion, and judges who support the killing of an innocent human being, are also so intent on simultaneously undermining the Christian faith in America through a number of ways, judicial tyranny as well. Now, the Supreme Court's support for abortion in 1973, when I was your age, Jennifer, it's really illegitimate, Dan. I mean, that's the way I look at it, because Supreme Court justices really did not have the authority to contradict God's moral code and call it a law. And that erroneous legal reasoning, right, uh, by the court in Roe v. Wade, uh, nevertheless, was used uh, as well as, you know, these other recent rulings that are that go against God's higher law on, on uh, taking God out of the Pledge of Allegiance. And, you know, it's, Dan, I know you're, you're a, have done a lot of study in this area. It's kind of a logical culmination, though, isn't it, of a hundred years of this evolving legal philosophy that began uh, heading down the wrong road all the way back to 1872, really, with Oliver Wendell Holmes when he declared the death of God in the legal world. And, um, well, you know what? I I, I was up in Washington... uh, Sorry for being so long-winded. I want you guys to jump in here. I I was up in Washington a few months ago, and I I went to the Lincoln Memorial, and you know I just you look at his eyes and how he's looking, sitting in that big white chair and looking down on the nation that he helped save, and he's got that look of sorrow in his eye, though it's kind of strange for a monument. But you know Lincoln recognized that America's foundation in the moral law of God. Uh, He declared it in 1859, I think was the day. It was either 59 or 1860, during his presidential campaign. And he said that slavery and the recent Supreme Court decision back then called the Dred Scott decision were not law because they contradicted the moral law of God. And, you know, because he knew the founders declared the equality of all mankind— all Americans in the Declaration, right? The right of life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. We're all in the same level playing field. But a paradox was created, right, when that three-fifths compromise in the Constitution, uh, a measure uh, uh, that uh, by the North really, I think, was used to lessen the uh, political strength of the South uh, slave states, by counting slaves, people, as only three-fifths of a person for apportionment purposes, right? Right. But but this paradox, Dan, was finally eliminated by the 14th Amendment, thank God, which recognized all men truly imbued by in the image of God, made in the image of God. And it guaranteed what we're talking about today, the, the, the guarantee of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Well, John, you're you know you've opened a, a big discussion here because in reality we have to stretch right back through time and look at the Hebrew Republic and the American Republic. In both instances, Moses, inspiration of God, having drafted um, the, the, the 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 documents in the Bible that talk about the organization of government. Part of it is they saw um, God saw and inspired Moses to write controls and limitations on different areas of the Hebrew government. And our American founding fathers took the same principles. So we have to understand that our Constitution and our Declaration, which is the preamble, and English common law and all those documents are based on a a presupposition of biblical truth. So you're right. We have to go back to what does God say in his word. Um, Regardless what your disposition is from a religious point of view, Um, That is, in fact, what crafted our Constitution and our Declaration. Now we go to the Supreme Court, and and you're right. That was really an unconstitutional ruling in 1973, uh, Roe v. Wade, and here's why. The judges were never to legislate from the bench. They were to read the law that somebody was suggesting, 
read the Constitution, the Declaration. They were supposed to be well grounded in the founding documents of America, which would include the Bible. And often the Bible was used as a precedent and, in fact, simply rule that this is a constitutional statement or an unconstitutional statement. Well, when the Supreme Court ruled in 73 that abortion for all practical purposes was legal, they were usurping the entire intent of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. If you are going to limit life before it even begins in terms of this physical world, then how can it have pursuit of happiness? You're already limiting the ability of that human being to do something. Now, what's interesting is today we're trying to define when does life begin. Well, let's go through to a biblical um, presupposition, and that is God is Alpha and Omega. God is beginning and end. God knows all things, saw all things, knows the beginning to the end of all of history, which means when God created all of humankind, God saw every single human being as an existence at the creation of Adam, at the creation of Earth, at the creation of everything, which means every human being is a viable human being created in the image of God from the point of inception, not even conception, inception. In other words, when God conceived of all of creation, we were all there. So the concept that life begins at birth, life begins at conception, sperm and egg, is really kind of a, a, this, our, our concept has to go deeper than that. God actually brought us all into existence before man really has any conscience of knowing our existence. So the viability of every human being is as long as God wants it to be. And that's why this debate about when does life begin, well, life began, I guess for us, the moment a child is conceived. And so to take away life before they're born is to take away life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness which the judges should have understood and said, no, abortion is wrong. And we existed that way for many, many years. So that's kind of my take on the whole constitutional issue in, a, in a, what I consider kind of a simple understanding that takes you all the way back and purges any discussion of, well, when does life begin? Everybody wants to debate when that has happened, the third trimester, the first trimester. I'm saying life begins because God conceived all of life at the beginning of time. I think you're absolutely right, Dan. You know, in Psalm 51, 5, David tells us, Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. And since sinfulness is a spiritual condition rather than a physical condition, David must have had a spiritual nature from the time of conception. And God also tells us, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, in Jeremiah 1, 5. You know, the biblical foundations for life beginning at conception are there. Um, there's lots of verses that show us that. But there's also been recent scientific uh, gains uh, through a lot of studies that are showing that the baby is psychologically and physically aware of his surroundings from as early as three weeks after conception. Uh, A scientist named Michael Lieberman showed an unborn child grows emotionally agitated, shown by the quickening of his heartbeat, each time his mother thinks about having a cigarette. And this is because the baby loses his oxygen source. His oxygen source goes way down when the mother smokes. So every time the mother thinks of having a cigarette, the baby's heartbeat raises and the baby goes into a, a, a fetal distress, they call it. If this is not a person, how is this baby feeling emotions? How is this baby so connected psychologically and physically with the mother that it's able to intercept what the mother is thinking and feeling. Of course, this is, an, this is a child. This is a separate entity. It's having feelings based on what its mother is feeling, just like it does after it's born. The entire concept that this is not a, a child, that this is, a, this is a, a fetus that has no viability is totally inaccurate. And I, I just, I just want to stress that it's the fact that this child is able to feel and think, and have emotions before it's born, should show us beyond a shadow of a doubt that this is a person. Exactly. I don't think there's any doubt that God established for Israel a a law code that even he placed a higher value on protecting the life of a pregnant woman. 
uh, and her preborn child than the life of anyone else in uh, Israel society. You know, I won't go into it tonight. We don't have time. But just read the book of Exodus, chapter 21. Uh, read that, 20 through, 22 through 25 especially, but you'll see that the conclusion from all these verses in the Bible, When uh, how about the time when, when uh, Mary uh, was greeted, uh, uh, when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary and the baby leaped in her womb? Uh, and uh, there's so many uh, obvious conclusions from all these verses and stories in the Bible that teach that uh, we should think and know in our conscience. And I, I think, unfortunately, a lot of people know this and deny their conscience, that the preborn child is a person at the moment of conception, like you said, Dan. And um, we should give, uh, you know, the child legal protection at least equal uh, to, to others in society. And we don't do that. Now, something you said, Jenna, that made me just think, let's talk a little bit about arguments from just common sense, reason, as evidence apart from the Bible, okay? Because somebody could say, I just don't believe in the Bible. Give me some reasons. Well, we know, as you said, there's medical evidence about the distinct genetic identity, the distinct DNA of a child. Uh can be used to show that the preborn child is far different in every cell of its body. Dan, how many cells do we have in our body? Isn't it like billions? Billions. Tr- trillions, oh. literally, right? Yeah, I, I, your eyes have billions. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it shows that every single cell of its body is different from every part of the mother's own body. Now, here's the, here's the kicker. You know, mult, uh, modern ultrasound technology. It, it's given these realistic images that people see now. And for that reason, they can see the baby, right? And for that reason, many of these abortion advocates try to discourage a pregnant woman from seeing these vivid images of her baby. You know, Nancy Keenan, I don't know if she's still the president of NARAL. Uh It's a pro-abortion women's group in Washington. But she said, and I'm quoting her, here's what she said. Politicians should not require a doctor to perform a medical unnecessary ultrasound, nor should they force a woman to view an ultrasound against her will. You believe that? And and here's, let, let me quote one other guy, an abortion advocate, this is a little different, William Sailton, he wrote in Slate Magazine. Here's what he said. He said, ultrasound has exposed the life in the womb to those of us who didn't want to see what abortion kills. The fetus is squirming, and so are we. Now, I don't know. I I don't know how many states now are... They're still considering ultrasound laws. I think a few states have passed them. But I'll tell you, I think every woman who has a conscience and every woman has a conscience should be given an opportunity to view an ultrasound of her pre-born child prior to having an abortion. I mean, at least they would realize this is a real human being. Actually, Ohio right now, and this is current, this is from yesterday, is um, the Ohio senators are hearing something right now called the heartbeat abortion bill. And what this bill would do is um, it would require the doctor to listen for a heartbeat. And if a heartbeat is present, an abortion cannot be committed. Uh, This is a great bill. It's going through right now. And it would actually overturn Roe versus Wade. What we have to look at now is supporting the people, the legislators, the politicians who are pushing these bills because they have a very strong, well-funded force fighting against them. And if you go to our website, thestoryofliberty.net, we have links posted for you to sign these particular petitions for the different senators 
and congressmen who are trying to pass these bills. Um, right now, we're going to listen to a clip by Ronald Reagan uh, explaining how Constitution and personhood uh, give un- unborn babies the right to life. With me, abortion is not a problem of religion. It's a problem of the Constitution. I believe that until and unless someone can establish that the unborn child is not a living human being, then that child is already protected by the Constitution, which guarantees life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness to all of us. Hmm. You know, it's interesting. Not complicated, is it, John? No. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, exactly. I, I was going to say the same thing. It's, um, you know, you asked for these... Um, to the person who's not a Christian, and by the way, Christians really need to, um, um, some Christians still support abortion for some very strange reasons, but there's really no biblical premise for them to do that. And all I can say is Christians really need to um, clean up their act and, and, and work to stop abortions. But for those people that are, are not Christians, I, I should say actually Muslims, uh, Jewish people, and Christians all have um, theological um, backdrops to say abortion is wrong. And, and people who are truly Jewish, truly Christian, and truly Muslim all ought to be adamantly against abortions, period. Now, for those people that don't believe in abortions, you have to really think about the ramifications and the pathologies that come with this point of view. If, in fact, we're defining children as not viable human beings for the first nine months of life, then we come to the logical conclusion that, well, when does viable life begin? Or do, when does it end? Um, Does it really begin when we're five years old and end when we're 72? And then you have philosophers and professors at certain universities are now saying, well, let's in fact be honest. We don't believe life is viable before birth, and we know that a baby, of course, doesn't become a viable human being unless it's cared for, right? It has to be bottled or breastfed. It has to be brought into a heated room or it would freeze to death. The child has to get certain cares. Well, then why can't we terminate lives up to three years old? And after 72, or when certain medical problems begin to occur in our bodies because we're not as functional as we used to be. And in that worldview, in that humanistic worldview, that's a viable path for them to go down, that we can begin to choose when life starts and stops at our own comfort. We begin to play God. And there are people calling for that. There are people actually honestly making that debate that maybe we can still choose up to two and a half years old to retain that child's life or terminate it. Maybe we don't want a little blonde, blonde baby boy. Maybe we want a dark-haired little baby girl or something. And then we can make those decisions. Once we go down that path, we have really entered Hitler's Germany. Because prior to World War II, one of the things they did is they sterilized and terminated people that just weren't quite right. Hmm. We are heading down that same pathology. It's just a matter of time till that makes sense to people. That's well, why abortion can't be defined because we want to define that life begins or ends at a certain point. It has to be a premise that says life is viable, period. From the point that we understand it's life, which is at conception, till we breathe our last breath, life has to be protected or else nobody's life is safe. Well, and that's why uh, we're ending up our first portion here, why all children should be wanted children. We're going to return in a few minutes with the story of liberty with Dan Williamson and Jennifer Featherstone. See you in just a few. Welcome back to the story of liberty. I'm your host, John Bona, co-host Jennifer Featherstone and Dan Williamson. And we're talking about the precious value of life. You know, I... We kind of uh, ended off there, Dan, talking about um, uh, different uh, scenarios in the Bible that were told about. One that I always found very interesting was the the Hebrew midwives. And, and this was at a time when, you know, when we read in the book of Exodus chapter 1, verse 14, I think through 17. But it says their lives are really bitter and harsh and that's when Israel was laboring in, in brick and mortar and all kinds of work in the fields. And, and the Egyptians were really riding their backs. And the king of Egypt made a law, basically, 
to the to the Hebrew midwives, and he he said when you're helping the Hebrew woman uh, during childbirth on the delivery stool, and actually when now this is when the baby is being born, it's kind of like a like it would be a partial birth abortion murder, and and in, and in this case, he said if you see the baby is a boy, kill him. That's what they do in partial birth abortion. You know that? The baby is actually born. The head is out. They crush the head of the baby while he's alive, and they suck his brains out. I mean, I, I don't know how to say that in a nice way. That's what partial birth abortion. Now, thank God that President Bush uh, finally, and that went to the Supreme Court, and it's law, and there's law against that, but. But anyway, getting back to this, the, the, the midwives, see, they they feared God. Now, these are Jewish women. They feared God, and, and they did not do what the king of Egypt told them to do, and they let the boys live. See, they wouldn't commit murder. They knew it was murder. You know, it's interesting today, Jenna, that and Dan, that uh, the Jewish women statistically, even today's world, are least likely to have an abortion. I find that interesting. And and you know why I understand that? Because the Jewish families, they have that Judeo-Christian philosophy, really, in in terms of the precious value of life, the God-ordained family, and the importance of that. Dan, now, in the break, we were talking about uh, what happened in China years ago, and how that's affected that nation with abortion. That's right, John. Uh, China established a one-child policy, kind of like Pharaoh looking into the land of Goshen, saying, look at those Hebrews, they're so populous. China looked at its people and decided they had too many. And so families were only allowed to have one child. Well, what happened is there's cultural ramifications to that. And that is the Chinese people having strong ancestral ties began to only retain the little boys because they needed that family heritage to be passed down through the son's line. And so over the years, um, and now it's been a number of years, I'm guessing 30 to 40 years now at least that that's been going on, uh, China has had one child per family, a boy. Well, folks, we all know it takes a boy and a girl. And now what they have is, and this is the estimates as they exist today, Approximately 70 million young Chinese men just plain aren't going to find a wife. There is no little girl out there um, to be uh, married to this young man. Young men that do not uh, find that relationship and wander around aimlessly with nothing to do are a problem. And uh, China is also now running into the economic ramifications of this because GDP is based on that working age individual along with productivity. And their population is suddenly going to, um, I think it's half, it's going to cut in half in the next 30 years. They're suddenly going to lose an enormous part of their workforce, and their, their, their people are going to suddenly age, which means a whole group of people are going to not be available in the workforce, and a whole bunch of people are going to suddenly be older, retired from the workforce. And this is going to happen not gradually. It's going to happen in enormous steps. This is a huge opportunity for Christians to see this in China, especially the Christians in China, and start having children. Like the midwives, defy Pharaoh. They have the obligation to do that because the Bible says they can. And let those little babies be born, and those Christian families have four, five, six, seven, eight, ten kids. And literally within the same 30-year generation that the rest of the Chinese population is going to suddenly shrink, the Christian population could enormously grow. And they could find themselves having a a substantial influence on the culture. Um, You know, this is is the the penalty of sin. When you do things against God, there'll be a penalty that comes back. America's facing the same problem, John. We've aborted uh, 50-plus million babies, and those are the ones we account for. We're not even talking about all the ones that different forms of birth control remove in other ways. But these little babies that in in 73 that we began aborting, if you do the math on this, they would be at the middle of their working productivity right now, and we don't have them. Um, A lot of people argue about the immigration issue. 
but we've replaced a lot of those workers with the people that have immigrated into this nation. It's about approximately 1.4 million. That's what we're missing, and that's what's been replaced. Well, if we don't change our ways, we'll, we will be short of the other half of the gross domestic product pyramid because we won't have the workers. And God warns us, when we sin, comes death. Our nation needs to repent, change its ways, have the babies that God has prepared for us, and let our families be the families they need to be that God has planned, not man has planned, that God has planned. You know, Dan, that's absolutely right. It, there's over a million babies aborted a year in the United States. And one of the biggest arguments for people that believe in abortion say, well, you don't want the mother to have that baby. It's not wanted. You know, it's not a wanted baby. But there's over a million people on waiting lists every year in the United States to adopt babies. So this supply of babies, I hate to say it, but that's how the abortion the abortionists don't look at them as they believe that these babies are just this unwanted supply of tissue, and let's just get rid of them. But what they don't realize is those babies, these these people who have rights under the Constitution, have families waiting for them that want to adopt them and take care of them. So every year, those babies that are aborted have families waiting for them, and that's something we have to think about. These babies are wanted. Right now, we're going to listen to a clip by Ronald Reagan um, speaking about how much, how, how the need for these children to become um, adopted by loving, caring families. One day, a pretty, fresh-faced young lady, intelligent and sincerely concerned, asked me if abortion wasn't preferable to making a young, unmarried girl have a baby she didn't want and which would therefore grow up unloved and probably turn out to be a criminal. I gave an answer which apparently she hadn't considered. I told her there were literally millions of people in this country who wanted but could not have children and who waited eagerly, sometimes for years, to adopt the baby she had described. That such a child would not be unloved, very much the opposite was true. Well, that was the great Ronald Reagan. Boy, I miss him. And, uh, of course, he's with the Lord now and been doing a lot better than we are, right? You know, this argument against abortion from, uh, just from reason, what you guys are talking about, you know, the incalculable loss of of goodwill from our nation, from the death of, the deaths of more than one million babies each year from 1973, the Roe v. Wade decision. Now we're over 50 million put to death through abortion. And, you know... Like you said, Dan, some of those now, I guess they'd be, what, 38, 39 years old. Oh, yeah. Other, others would be 36, 35, 34, right, down to one year old. Uh-huh. Every year, you know. And there's no doubt some would be scientists, doctors, engineers, business leaders, entrepreneurs. There's probably great artists in that group, electricians, poets, great carpenters. Musicians, imagine the sports figures that were murdered in abortion. Probably the best baseball player, basketball player. Political leaders that could be leading our nation and so forth, you know. And this is what really, I mean, personally to me, when I I hear somebody say that, you know, I'm personally opposed to abortion but I, I think that this is decisions up to the mother and the doctor, and I'm, I'm not going to get involved with that or make an argument. But, you know, the reality is when God established his commandments and he gave the people a code to live by, people knew the difference between right or wrong. They could read it right in his word, and they knew the difference. And these moral standards that God revealed in Scripture were real clear. There was no doubt what was right or wrong. Now, now hear this. The fact doesn't change when people do not believe in the Bible. If you don't believe in the Bible, or you don't think it contains God's moral standards, it's still true. And it still does contain his moral standards for all people for all time. See, 
That's just the way it is. So even the unbelievers uh, who opposed the early Christians in the back of St. Peter's Day, when they were speaking to the Greek philosophers in Athens, and Paul even told them that God who made the world and everything in it, this is the same God who commands people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day when he'll judge the world in righteousness. It doesn't matter if you're a believer or an unbeliever. You're on the hook. And, you know, Proverbs 24, 11, Dan, when I read that years ago, that really convicted me of it's obvious you can't just sit back and do nothing about this abortion issue. All of us have to do something to try to end this travesty of America. And um, and whenever that's done, that's God's, God's timing, isn't it? Yes, it is. You know, I, I listened to the adoption discussion. And it's it's um, it's it's hard for me because um, we just adopted, of course, a little boy, and everybody thinks that um, you adopt a little boy and somehow you change him. And the reality is, when you adopt a person in your home, they transform you. You know, we talk about diversity in this culture, and we talk about learning to get along with each other. But when you bring someone into your home that's not, how should we say it, part of your genetic code, he's got a different wiring system, he's got a different little bit of a look to him, and yet he teaches us every day all about how uniquely different God has made the whole world. And, you know... (laughs) His, his little face, because he's a 5 a.m. little guy, right? And uh, he's waking us up at the crack of dawn with his big smile, hopping up and down in his crib. We are so blessed by that adoption, and so are all, all the rest of my children. Mm. Well, that's, you know, that's something we can all take to heart, Dan. Thank you for, you know, sharing that personal testimony, how an adopted child is... You not only have blessed his life, but he's blessed the lives of your entire family. And, Absolutely. Uh, and but, our neighbors and friends. I think that's just the most beautiful thing, taking a child and raising him up and giving him a life that he wouldn't have had otherwise. What you're doing is showing this child life, giving him the ability to Live a life with a loving family. You know, the word abortion comes from the Latin word abori, which means to perish. And um, I had this teacher in high school. Her name was Mrs. Cork. She was my Latin teacher. And uh, the class was pretty boring. But one thing she would always say to us is, to find the meaning of something, look back at the word where it started. Look at the root of that word. She's like, it's, it's like that with everything in life. To figure out the concept of something, look back where it started. And that's probably the only thing I you know, took with me from that class, but I've used it a lot in my life. And if you look back at that word abortion, the word abor means to perish. And it may briefly be briefly defined as the loss of life. So for me, looking back at this word, abortion, its actual definition means loss of life. If you think about that, they're using terminology and then turning around and saying that word doesn't actually mean what it means. We need to step up to the plate and realize that so many of these children, if the woman was just given the ability to see an ultrasound, and, to, and if Planned Parenthood would just, instead of pushing these abortions, I, they pushed 300,000 abortions last year and only gave 1,000 adoption referrals. If they would present both sides of this, show the woman an ultrasound, give her adoption information. They don't, I'm not saying don't present the abortion information. It, it's legal right now, but we're fighting to make it illegal. If they would just provide the woman with these different options and show her 
that this life she's carrying inside of her is precious. There's other options. What a difference that would make. The woman suffers <laughs> huge repercussions, both mentally and physically after an abortion. It's a horrible, horrible procedure. Judges cannot be above the Constitution either because they swore to uphold the Constitution. How could you be above something you swore to uphold? When you swear to uphold something, you're under it. And all judges at every level take an oath to the Constitution. They don't take an oath to the Supreme Court or to the federal bench. See, the rule of law, and we've talked about the rule of law in several of our past programs, the rule of law in this country is really the U.S. Constitution under God's higher law, not the court's. This meant that if the Constitution says one thing and a federal judge or court says something else, or a federal or state official who is sworn to support the Constitution, they're supposed to follow the Constitution. Otherwise, it's a disregard of the rule of law. Now, I'm saying this because when a handful of people are given the, pro- the power, like the Supreme Court, to override the words of the Constitution and our Declaration, the rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and to oppose their agenda, as that happened in 1973, I think it was a 7-2 to two vote, actually, upon the whole nation, simply because they carry the title of Supreme Court judge. And then there's no dissenting opinion permitted from their opinion on the Constitution. And they they use some skewed, you should read that, the, the evidence they use to do this, it's so, we don't have time tonight, but it's so far-reaching, it's not even close to what's written in our Constitution. And, you know, Dan, when we get to the point, I know you've talked about this several times, when we'd rather live by the rule of men but it's not the the Constitution, but those who interpret it, those who govern us. You know, under the guise of interpreting the, the Constitution, the federal courts and the Supreme Court in many cases, they violated every principle of the rule of law. Especially, I mean, just we're talking about abortion, right? As far as that goes, as the law on abortion, I mean, what, for 200 years in America, no right to an abortion ever existed in America. But in 1973, the United States Supreme Court, nine justices, invented one. They literally invented a right to have an abortion. Now... That is not following the rule of law. Why has this happened? Because we've exalted the Supreme Court and some of these federal courts as gatekeepers of our laws. And our fundamental law has changed with them, whatever they think. Now, we have seen it, folks. This is the America we're in today. The Supreme Court and other courts They're making decisions based on their feelings rather than the words of the Constitution they swore to uphold. They're denying the rule of law. And they're making judicial decisions that, I'll tell you, they're nearly impossible to predict what's next. Now, we need to get back to the rule of law, don't we? You really do. Well, you know, John, there's that old saying that says you don't break God's law, God's law breaks you. And we will be forced back to the rule of law whether we like it or not. By the very nature of how everything is designed to work. And so it's just a matter of time. And uh, I think some people think they're, they're fooling God by shaking their fist at him saying, I can do it my way. But if you really honestly look at Oh, the divorce rate in the United States, 
at 50%, whether it be Christian or non-Christian, frankly, um, and look at the pathologies that have occurred due to that, the broken families, the confused children, the um, dysfunction of our culture right now, and then everything that comes off of that, all the problems, the abortions, the theft, the, um, uh, the greed, and all the things that occur, we are being forced back to God's law, whether we like it or not. And so, you know, my dad used to say the pendulum swings. And I would say that we're, we're, we're slowly getting to the bottom of ourselves. And there is going to be a point here where it just won't work. And uh, when we stop denying what's obvious, um, there'll be some that will continue to say, you know, the emperor has no clothes and uh, we need to change our ways. The question is, will the nation have the moral wherewithal and the stamina to make the changes? And um, there are groups of people that have that are working hard to institute these ideas into their children to change the culture in the next 30 to 50 years. But we will never get away from God's law because it's, it's very obvious that it works. One man, one woman makes a marriage and raise children. Uh, Jenna, I know you have a bunch of children like I do, and boys and girls are different, aren't they? Very different. And it takes mom and dad. And John, you have how many grandkids and your own children, and they yeah. were all different. We're fooling ourselves if we think we can create some kind of a hybrid family of two moms with their six kids and somehow accomplish the same result that a mom and a dad, with all the the shortfalls that we have, um, it is still God's way. And God's way produces the fruit that builds stable culture. The Romans knew it. The Greeks knew it. Every culture is knowing it. And every time they moved away from God's law and moved to a different set of truths, the destruction begins to occur. Christians used to sneak the Roman babies away as they were put up on the wall or put out to die because they didn't want all these children. The Christians would take them in and adopt them and raise them. And for doing that, the Romans would hunt them down and kill them. You know, folks, if if you were involved in an abortion in one way or another, there still is a way out. And Scripture tells us if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us. Thank you for joining us this evening with the Story of Liberty. We'll be back next week. God bless you, and have a good evening.